Hello, I'm Dr. Pierre Simon, and it's great being back with you as we talk about moral decision making. Today we're on social conformity, but before we start, I'd like to remind you that at New Horizons Institute of Counseling, we're for healing, peace, and harmony. And we hope you'll keep that in mind if you're in need of that kind of help. Uh, we have uh, previously been in the state levels, talking about the levels of moral decision making. Uh, last time uh, uh, within, well, let's say within the mor moral decision making uh, law of God, you know, we have human laws, we have God laws. Uh, within the God laws of human decision making, moral development is a process in which people will form a developing sense of well, right and wrong. You know, when you're born, you don't know right and wrong. You only know what feels good and what doesn't feel good. And oftentimes it doesn't feel good until you get to sleep at night when you're an infant. In previous episodes, we're discussed, uh, we've uh, talked about reward and punishment, number one. And uh, reward and punishment is the earliest development of understanding of right and wrong. And uh, we spoke about some of those characteristics in that reward and punishment as we mature. And marketplace exchange we spoke of last time, which is the immature moral decision making where there's an understanding between fellow members. If you do something for me, I'll do something for you. We see that on TV a lot. Today, we're deliberating on right and wrong of peer pressure through social conformity. Social conformity is among the seven levels of moral decision-making identified by Christian psychiatrist Tim Jennings. Uh, and social conformity is number three on his list. Number four, the next time, uh, and we're gonna do part two of social conformity next time, but we'll get into law and order after that. Uh, keep in mind that from number four, law and order down, those are considered immature. Uh, they're, they're not considered mature levels of decision-making, of thinking through problems, working them out, and doing them right, uh, solving them in a proper way or in God's way of solving them, I in His design law of solving things. That is, the way He creates things uh, are in an order that never changes. It's always the same. But human laws change. Government decides they don't want you to uh, know the details of a bill. They give you a general uh, uh, bill that they may pass so they can interpret it if they want to deem that you're doing something wrong. And, and a lot of people do those, those kinds of things. Uh, so they can change their rules, like you do when you're playing board games with your friends sometimes. Well, uh, social conformity, when we think about it, it's found a lot in the Bible. Uh, it talks about it a great deal, and so I, I thought, well, let's start with a scripture. Let's start with Romans chapter 12, verse 2, where it's talking about basically social conformity um, and Keep in mind as we're talking about this, we'll be explaining it a little bit more later on. Uh, but it says, and do not be conformed to this world. Now, okay, that makes it easy, doesn't it? Uh, don't be conformed to this world. Who, do I, who am I supposed to be conformed to then? Well, I'm supposed to be conformed to God, design laws of God, those things that are ethical, right, uh, good, moral, and so on. In the Amplified Version, it adds any longer with its superficial values and customs. Human law has superficial values and you might say superficial customs. But be transformed, the Bible tells us, and progressively changed. Don't be like them. Be like how God intends you to be 
which is the person who you are, the, the person on the inside, that identity that he has given you from conception. As you mature spiritually, it says. So maturing is not just getting older, getting taller, uh, stronger, or, or uh, less hair. Uh, maturing is also spiritual maturing, emotional maturing by the renewing of your mind. So how do you renew your mind? Well, renewing of your mind isn't book learning. It's focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes. That's what the scripture is referring to when it says renew your mind. So that you may prove, who am I proving it to? Well, I've proven it to myself. I'm not worried about what you think of me. I'm concerned that I'm doing right so I can get up in the morning with a clear conscience so I can do those right things in the day of whatever God um, has laid out for me that day, whatever opportunities that he has, whatever, uh, whoever he may bring my way, we are other-centered. So we're to think of others and do for others as best we can. So I, I have to be more considerate of who am I that I can do these things that are good, that are uh, of mature spiritual value because that brings the ideal payback. You know, we reap what we sow. You do it the other way, you go by the human standards, payback is harsh. Uh, and we'll be talking about that as well. Prove to yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good acceptable and, and perfect in his plan and pur purpose for you. You do things based on human law. What, what tends to happen is it's not always good. It's not always acceptable if they're not getting what they want. And you're not going to be getting what you want no matter how much you think you're getting. It's never enough. The perfect standard is God's standard. And when we realize it, if we just keep it simple, trust in God, that's, that's as simple as you have to keep it. You don't, it doesn't have to be complicated. Trust in God. Everything else falls into place. Those major things, when you finally are able to surrender yourself to God's design laws, to God's divine laws, <sighs> big weight gets lifted off. And all these major things you think that are going on around you seem so unimportant, they seem simplified, and you feel like you're better off working through them at that point. You're less burdened by all this other stuff. The term conformity is often used to indicate an agreement to the majority position, brought about either by a desire to fit in or be liked. That would be, hey, normal. Do you remember in growing up uh, in elementary school? It was okay, you know, you were pretty independent and all that, but uh, you got into middle school and above, you really wanted to be liked. It was very important to be um, part of the group of everyone else and so you wanted to fit in. You wanted to be normal or because uh, of a desire to be correct is, is another term for conformity and correctness is information. You know, so I need information to be correct. So you have certain personality types out there. In fact, there's uh, uh, several studies that indicate uh, the proactive personality type is 13 to 18 percent uh, of the population. Proactive personality type may have different temperaments in it. Uh, usually you'll see a melancholy uh, in social, uh, a, uh, a, a supine in, in affection, I mean a supine in control and 
uh, perhaps even a, a sanguine uh, or a phlegmatic in, uh, in affection, where uh, information is important to all of those temperaments and in, in those different areas, and they want to be right. They, they don't want to do wrong. They, they want, they're very sensitive and they think deep, more deeply, but because they want to be right, they want to do right, they want to give you the information to do it as well. And if they're, if they're not raised uh, in a way that helps them to learn relationships and, and how to communicate those relationships, they can be a bit uh, abrasive perhaps when they're telling you something. It's not intended to be that way. It's not purposely done to make you look bad or uh, that they're uh, criticizing you. It's just the way they communicate. And when you recognize the about, that about them, they don't bother you as much when you're working with them and all that. In fact, you look forward to their responses because you know, yeah, they're probably gonna be right uh, because that's important to them. So that's in information. Uh, or another form of conformity is simply to conform to a social role or identification. You know, Hi, I'm Pierre and I'm a Christian. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Mary and uh, I'm a housewife, um, and so on and so forth. So identification becomes very important to those in that area of conformity. Did you know that in human social conformity, discerning right and wrong is really dependent on others? It's not dependent on you. Um, human social conformity is dependent on the group, the community, the church, or the, uh, the business, the company you work for. It, it's, if others are doing it, it's okay for me to do it. And that's social conformity. So it's not by your standard anymore, it's by the standard of those around you, your environment. Think of the speed limit. You know, how many of you go 25 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone? I, I'm, I'm admitting I, I don't. I can't seem to stay on 25 in a 25 mile an hour zone. It's gotta creep up a little bit. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I keep it, you know, not, not too much, but doesn't everybody go at least five miles an hour above the speed limit? Well, you know, do you? Uh, I don't know, maybe you don't, and that's great. But sometimes it's dangerous on the highway going the speed limit. They're all passing you so fast, you almost have to keep up with the group because everybody else is doing it. Then you feel a little more comfortable. Doesn't make it right though. Peer approval lends itself to peer pressure. Those who dwell within this immature level of moral decision-making will say if you're not in conformity, you're undermining social order. That's their excuse. Vengeance, for example, as found in the previously spoken of Code of Hammurabi, is acceptable if the peer group or the community is supportive. I suppose that's why you see in so many countries uh, around the world, vengeance seems to be, retaliation seems to be the norm, whereas it's not so normal around here. In contrast, you'll find that Eastern cultures are more likely to value the needs of the family and other social groups before individual needs. Now I say that because individual needs are very important and we're gonna talk some more about that later. The collectivist cultures, Eastern and some South American countries are more likely to conform to social uh, group and community pressures. In collectivist cultures, people are considered good if they're generous, helpful, dependable, and attentive to the needs of others. So there's some laws there, human laws. You have to be this way, 
and you're considered good. Good enough to whatever, wherever you're supposed to go, you'll go there. If not, then you're not good. You're not good enough. This contrast with individualistic cultures, which often place a greater emphasis on characteristics such as assertiveness and independence. One of the many Bible references regarding social conformity we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 17 to 18, where in the Remedy Bible it says, the Lord says, come out from the sick and be separate from the dying. Don't touch that which will poison your body, contaminate your soul, or soil your character. I will be your father, it goes on to say and you'll be transformed to be like me, to be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's not just talking about touching dead bodies. That's talking about touching those things that are, mm, in a sense, diseases, social diseases for you and me. Stay away from those things the scripture's indicating. Don't be part of that because it's like poison to your body. Sin is an infection. The longer the infection remains, the more it grows. The more it grows, the sicker you become. And without intervention from the doctor, the medicine, you'll die from that sin, from that disease. And sin is selfishness. It's basically what it is, thinking of self, doing whatever is right for you, but it's not other-centered. And that's how God designed us to be, to be other-centered. He put himself in us. We even have markers in us as though he wrote his name inside. As you, there's. Uh, plenty of studies showing those uh, those cells and different things, the shapes of our, our heart and, uh, and diaphragm and so on, and indicating, hey, God has written his name inside of us. And because of that, he made us to be a certain way that if we are that way, we thrive. If we're not that way, over time we die. And we can see this when someone is trying hard to uh, live a good life and, and be right, but because of pride or because of selfishness, um, they slip up here. And if they don't rebound quickly, their slip up gets stronger, more frequent, more intense is, is stronger. And what tends to happen is it's harder to come back. It's harder to be what you used to be or wanted to be because now you've seared your conscience by doing the wrong thing over and over again. Your conscience is numbing itself. It's not so bad after a while, it's more normal. But because it's sin, because it's something that's uh, selfish, not other-centered, it makes you sicker and sicker on the inside, cutting off the harmony, cutting off the flow, that harmonious flow between you and God, between you and others. And within yourself, it's like having a high cholesterol or a blood clot. You're cutting off your own circulation, which is life inside of you you're hindering that circulation of thriving. Now we don't want that, of course not. Well, next time we're gonna talk about part two of this, the adverse effects of social conformity. And I'm sure you'll find some interesting things in that as well. May your troubles be less, your blessings more, and may nothing but happiness come through your door. God bless, we'll talk to you next time.